So what was your role in Silent Hill 2? I performed the motion capture and voice recordings for James Sunderland. Tell us how you got the role of James Sunderland. Well, my daughter asked me to take her to an audition for a PlayStation 2 game. And while I was waiting, I noticed a script on a side table. I asked an assistant if I could audition for the part of James. Uh, and he said he would check. And when he came back, he told me that the part hadn't been decided yet, or uh, and so I could give it a shot. Um, when I went into the audition room, there was a long, wide table at the far side of the room with four Japanese uh, fellows sitting behind it. And they asked me to perform different uh, emotions and to mime certain actions. Uh, it lasted about 20 minutes, and uh, I enjoyed it because I, I like acting very much. And it, it, was, uh, it was an adrenaline rush because it wasn't something I was expecting to do that day. It, <laughs> it just happened. And uh, when it was over, they asked for a telephone number. <clears throat> and I, I gave them my Tokyo and U.S. numbers because I, I spend summers in New York. And uh, sure enough, that summer I got a call in New York. And the, um, at first the fellow said some things I didn't quite understand. And when I didn't react, uh, he said, you got the part. Uh, and, I, and I said, what part? <laughs> and I think he was, <laughs> he was disappointed that I didn't make immediate connections there. So then he reminded me that, you know, this was for Silent Hill 2. This is a really big role. And, you know, many people had tried out. This is a really important thing, et cetera, et cetera. So I was, you know, of course, I was very happy that, you know, to be recognized in that way. And, but I said, uh, well, listen, I just have one uh, problem here. I need to, I, I'm going to have to call you back. It's like, what, what are you talking about? I said, well, I have to uh, check with my daughter because, you, you know, you didn't call me to tell, to, you know, to say that she got the part. So I'm assuming she didn't get it. No, no, she didn't. Because she had gone to try out for Laura, right? So I got to ask her if she minds because it wasn't my thing. It was her thing. He's like, he, he, he couldn't get that at all. But uh, what's he going to do? Uh, I said, well, I'll call you back. So I called, I called my daughter and she was, of course, tremendously excited and supportive. So I called back the guy and then we worked out a recording schedule so that I could start the work after I got back to Tokyo. It added a dimension to my life that I didn't know I'd get a chance to fulfill. And that is to be publicly recognized for a performance. I honestly have always been a performer. Everything, uh, you know, I studied industrial design in my undergraduate and, uh, while I was doing that, I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's kind of a cross between engineering and design or art. And so we study engineering. We also study art and create images of what things will be like for the future and, and the advancement of human machine interfaces. That's, it's interesting work. And um, a lot, you know, there's when you work uh, on a new design at the end of that process, you've got sketches and drawings, renderings, or perhaps computer models at this time. And you got to make a presentation, usually to a group of executives, people with MBAs who went to name brand schools. For me, I recognized right away, even in the school setting, you're standing in front of 25 people presenting your work. This is a performance. And a lot of what makes one presentation seem better than the other is the engagement of the presenter with the audience. So it is a performance. And I, so I, you know, I said to the head of the program that I didn't want to take a second year of communications because I thought that course was ridiculous. I wanted to take acting for my, uh, what do you call it? The, the credit requirement. And he said, well, see, he, you take acting on your own. And then <laughs> after, if you think it helped you, uh, you tell me and I'll consider that for future years as to whether we'll accept it for a commun an alternative to communications credit. And I, I did take the course. 
um, and I took two semesters of it. I loved it. It was a great, great uh, awakening in how to carry yourself in front of people and how to how to present uh, ideas. And, and, and hell, I learned the how to pick up a dead body trick in that second semester. That was that came in handy later on. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> What's, What's a that? dead body trick? <laughs> Oh, you haven't heard that one? No, uh, I don't know what that is. Okay, well, that was a tough scene in in the uh, the toughest scene for me to perform in the in the game uh, production was the cut scene where I pick up Mary's dead body from that bed and carry her in front of me out of out of the room because the 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 game you know Sato and the team there they had a they were working to a, a, a schedule in their mind for how many seconds they wanted each piece to 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 take and monica is a beautiful woman and she was laying on a a frame to mock up a bed very low to the ground um and for me to bend down that low and get my arms under her and pick her pick her up with her acting dead it was it was taking too long to go through the process of getting her up and it, it bothered me a lot and then you know, I couldn't figure out why I wasn't able to do it um, faster. And it's one night I did like have a eureka moment when I was trying to play it through in my mind about and I remembered this trick from from the college acting class about how to pick up a dead body. And the trick is you approach the body and you casually grab the wrist of the arm closest to you and put it around your neck. And then the dead body latches onto your neck, which the audience doesn't even perceive. And that makes it easy to pick them up because you're lifting them up with your back, not with your your arms. You know, most of the weight is going straight to your to your neck and your back. So now you would think these guys are professional directors, right? <laughs> Nobody knows that. Only stage directors know those tricks. Yes. It's stagecraft. I mean, that, that gets passed down generation to generation from actors and directors and, and so forth. And that's why I was able to get it from that, uh, from that class. Whereas, you know, just trying to th- outthink the problem or, or outmuscle the problem, it wasn't, it wasn't working. They kept saying, mm-hmm. you, you have to go faster. <laughs> and um, it wasn't until I remembered that. So that was... Uh, my little story about the dead body trick. About the making of Silent Hill 2 documentary, why do you think your face was blurred out? Well, I knew nothing about the making of video before I saw it on YouTube. And that was thanks to some fans. Um, The people who filmed the mocap scenes that appear in that uh, making of video were Konami's people. And probably the same gals that were there every day videotaping the mocap sessions uh, because the CG artists use the videos in their character rendering process. Uh, there was never any mention uh, by Konami people of producing and making of video. In fact, I don't even think they had any ideas like that. I think it, it, they had no idea the game was going to be so popular. So, I mean, they hoped it would, but I'd be very surprised if they pre planned that if you if you look at the scenes from the mocap studio they're pretty raw it wasn't it wasn't uh i'm pretty sure they pulled it from the stuff they were they were filming i have some video from the from a mocap session day um <clears throat> my wife and and a couple of my children came by that day and and shot some they had a video camera with them and shot some video i've, I've described the process people have asked me about the mocap process before and that day was one of the days with mag uh mag gear magnetic gear and so they had this huge tail sticking out behind me of wires and a little minder one of the the young konami staff kind of walking behind me like carry like carrying the veil on a wedding dress she's carrying my tail so um like i say there there was never any mention of konami producing a making of video and so uh naturally there was never any talk about our agreement including that sort of thing uh, i don't know exactly why konami blurred my face but i am 99% certain it was konami that made that decision because they're the only ones who could make that decision. 
Do you know how Monica Taylor Horgan felt about the HD Collection voice acting debacle? I can't speak for Monica, but I can say that when I talked to her, um, really the first time after I had started getting involved in the HD Collection uh, uh, issues with with Konami, um, I I contacted her at that point where. I needed to get the other actors to agree, and she was not favorable. She was very angry, and the, the the thing she was most upset about was the use of her real face in that making of video. And she said that was definitely against her uh, agreement with them, and definitely something that's not supposed to be done. And uh, so, anyway, she <clears throat> that was the hardest part was getting her to let that go so we could put it all behind us that worked out well is there any aspect of your performance as james that you would change looking back on it well yeah sure uh there's a couple of lines i'd like to re-record i i don't really recall specifically which lines right now but (laughs) i know that when i watched well i'd have to watch that movie again when i watched that movie uh version of it on youtube i remember um cringing a few times. (laughs) Do you wish you had more time to work on your performance in Silent Hill 2? Were you aware of any money or time constraints on the project? No, I never felt like we were being squeezed. In fact, all, all I remember hearing about was how unusually large the budget was, how it was only because of the surprise success of Silent Hill 1 that they were able to command such a budget out of Konami. So, no, I don't think that's the case. Have you played the other games in the franchise? If so, how do the others measure up to Silent Hill 2? Well, I've never actually played Silent Hill 2, so I think it would be wrong of me to play any of the other games. My um, my daughter, the one who didn't get the part of Laura 13 years ago, found a PlayStation 2 that her brother had left in Japan when he moved to New York in the closet. So she's kind of bugging me now she says if you've got some of those games uh, yeah i've got one or two in the office um i want to try and play it so we might play it sometimes i don't want to play it alone it's scary i said yeah i i think so now the other uh games because they have so many fans who are very interested in details about it it clearly left a, a deep impact i mean it made a deep impact on on their their developing mind i've been very serious about responding to their questions i don't sometimes they refer to the other games so i had to at least inform myself about the other games by watching videos on youtube cutscenes that people have put up or videos discussing issues related to those other games so i'm familiar to a certain extent with the other games the other games don't measure up to silent hill 2 for different reasons um one was a first effort and probably under budgeted and you will see that the the recordings were done probably without any access to the the visuals from what the scenes were going to be like so there's a lot of disconnect between the the performance and the the vocal performance and the mocap they may have had a, actually a different person doing the mocap than they did the voice i'm not sure about that um and the story was a little uh Eh, let's just say uh, less detailed, less depth, and a little bit uh, common uh, cult, something like that, Dead, uh, Indian burial, burial ground, and that, that kind of stuff. I don't think it was nearly as sophisticated as the story in Silent Hill 2. The later games, once they started repeating me, uh, tropes i don't know what you got if i use the word meme my daughter gets all upset with me dad you don't know what that word means i said well (laughs) it had a meaning before your generation Mm -hmm. twisted it into meaning a a picture with words on facebook okay there there are certain cliche concepts and ideas and uh pyramid head became one of them following Mm. his appearance in silent hill 2 and to to bring him back again and again in the in the later programs was a in my opinion a a sign of creative fatigue so the story the pacing and the atmospheric mood that was created uh was outstanding in its time and even to this day so that's got to be it 
plus all the detail. But I, I, I mean that in the story. I'm not going to tell you that it was the actor's performances. I don't think we heard it, but it, it, if it had top quality voice actors doing the mocap and the recordings, it, it would have been as good, I think. So I don't take any responsibility for its success. I take, I'm proud that it was not, it doesn't fall on the performances. So, cause we did our best. Which lines of yours would you like to re-record? Oh, um, Gosh, there's there's so there's such minor things. I think if I if I mentioned them to you, you might be surprised. You might think, well, what was wrong with that one? So I I don't no no it it wasn't in my opinion it wasn't necessary to redo the the parts because the lines weren't performed well. It would have been uh, now uh, uh, there was a false story put forth at one point that the original recordings lacked the sound quality required for an HD release. That was total nonsense. So there was no need to re-record for HD. And they didn't. And they obviously they didn't. And I, I think it's safe to say that most people who watch it prefer the originals. I think it's great. I think, you know, it's fantastic, actually, that, that, that's, that this example is out there of what happens when you go back in and, and mess with the original, a, a, a successful original. It didn't work out well. I don't know what the people who are on the Konami side think about what went down with this much hindsight available to them, but uh, they're lucky it turned out the way it did. That was the best possible outcome considering where it was going. Imagine if they had released the HD collection without the original voices in Summer Hill 2. They, they never would have lived that down. At least it ended up like a, a, what do you call it, a truce. It was the best possible solution. I'm glad they saw that as well. I give them credit for that. It was hard. It must have been hard to back back away from the, the tr you know, the positions that they had dug and were reinforcing. But they did. So that's... Uh, it, Everyone benefited from that. Would you consider recording yourself playing Silent Hill 2? You know, a lot of people have asked me about that. And because I'm not really a gamer, I'm not sure. I mean, I have played games, but I, I, I don't play them often. And when I do, I kind of get into a, one of those crazy binge modes where you play until 2 and 3 in the morning and lose sleep. And you, know, <laughs> you just got to finish the game. So I appreciate why gaming is so addictive. And I appreciate good performances in games, but um, and I understand how you you can get very connected to the characters who are talking during the game. <laughs> so I get it. What I would consider doing is taking the parts that I am comfortable with, which are the performances between the characters or between the char uh, my character and and some some enemy uh, some monsters, and talk about that. When you said you were owed residuals from Konami, did you actually mean royalties? Is there a difference? Well, you know, that's I kind of regret having used that word. It was not my word. It was a word I heard from someone else involved in the program who I will not mention for to, to not cause any embarrassment. But what I actually wrote to Konami, that word residuals, I, I used it somewhere and it, people got hung up on it. But what I actually wrote to Konami was that they owed me additional compensation for several unauthorized reuses of my performances beyond our agreement. So I'm not sure the terms royalties and residuals have clear legal definitions in both the U.S. and J Japan jurisdictions or domiciles. And I don't really have a dog in that fight. It was just additional compensation that I was after. You, they, people can call it whatever they want. That's just uh, window dressing as far as I'm concerned. You've said that Konami owed you payment for your performance in Silent Hill 2. You've also said that Konami didn't make any written agreements with Silent Hill 2 voice actors. How was this agreement for residuals made if no contract was involved? There was no agreement for residuals or for additional compensation because that you know was never discussed. It wasn't part of the the agreement we had. So the here, here's how it went down. I had multiple discussions with different Konami executives, kind of worked my way up the chain to the top guy who finally came in one day and had a private meeting with me 
about my, my contract and the terms of my deal. And those meetings were all called at my request, not Konami's. It was me pushing the process. I asked Konami to define how they would make use of my performance. And frankly, I would have given them pretty much any rights they asked for because I was happy to be acting in the show. So they asked for PlayStation 2 in Japan and the U.S. Well, I took notes during those meetings and I expected the written agreements when they came would match up with what we had discussed. So the reasons I cited when I requested additional compensation were specifically related to game releases made outside of the U.S. and Japan territories and re-releases for consoles other than PS2. So those additional territories and consoles were never discussed. And so obviously they were never agreed to. So it mm. wasn't until much later that I learned from the other actors that none of them had been given written agreements to sign either. As strange as it may sound, it's almost as if Konami wanted that way, wanted it that way. I, I wanted to see the contract. So I kept pressing for it. I wanted to see what terms are, are put in there. You know, anytime you get a decent contract, this is good advice for all the young people out there. Anytime you get a contract put before you for something, keep a copy of it. They're great templates for the future. So, you know, me asking for the contract, I probably wouldn't have needed it if my curiosity hadn't been peaked in that way. I, I would have been satisfied to go with the verbal agreement, which was comfortable for me too, having been here 30 years, 20 at that time. Going back to the, the, the problem is Konami was strong arming people like uh, Monica and myself and Dave and, and Donna and basically saying, you're nobody, you don't have a leg to stand on, sign these papers retroactively, um, or else, um, you know, that's it. We, we just misplaced the paperwork. And I, that was a bald-faced lie. They had no paperwork. I knew it because I was the guy, I didn't know about the other characters. I couldn't be sure, but I knew that I never got anything. So I wondered, why would they take that approach? Why would they, their opening gambit be a lie? It must be something serious. They're, you know, they're feeling a serious exposure. So I wrote back and opened up a conversation with them that, you know, ultimately led to the first the exclusion of the original voices and then the the um, re-edition of them. If I could go back in time, I might play the whole thing differently, but that's how it worked out. It was instructive to the industry. It was instructive for fans. So I think overall it was a valuable process. Do you know if residuals are common for voice acting work in Japan? What about America? Well, you know, my, my personal expert on game voiceover performers, Dave Shoffley, told me that he receives one-time payments, additional compensation, each time a game he's in is re-released for a new, new, either for a newer console or released in a new territory. But he gets that money from other game producers, not Konami. He I'm gets curious. it from his agent. And the agent gets it from the game producer company or the game, you know, whoever's in charge. That's why uh, Thessaly was able to get money because she had the agent get the money. See, if it's a, I didn't have an agent. So for me, they cut me loose. They never hire me again. It's the end of the story. But if there's an agent, they've got an ongoing relationship with that agent and they're going to need to use him or probably likely want to use that agent again in the future. So they need to maintain a working relationship with him or her. So that's, that's, or, and, and in many cases, they're, they're not individuals, they're, they're businesses. If you ask me about America, I really don't know much about America other than the law I studied up on before I ever talked to Konami and the people I talked to the, the legal advisors in that in that part of the business, including the Screen Actors Guild and another union who represents um, the people who do voice work in games and so forth, to find out what's their position on continuing or reoccurring uh, compensation. And basically, in America, you get whatever you can negotiate, and if it's not in the contract, and the company wants to do something that wasn't permitted in the contract a new negotiation is needed or else the producer will be in a situation where the talent 
can claim, make a claim for reasonable compensation for any unauthorized uses. And there's an issue called moral rights and um, some really core rights that California law doesn't allow an artist to transfer. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not claiming to be an expert on it, but I did learn enough to know that because they hadn't specifically asked for those other territories and consoles, they were not entitled to them. And they certainly weren't entitled to the making of video, even if they blurred my face. So I felt it was unfair for them. You know, if they had never rattled my cage, if they had never come back and said, sign this blanket release, and we lost the paperwork that never existed, the HD collection would have just come out with our voices and nobody would have said anything. Mm. I wouldn't have said anything. Monica would have not said anything. And it just would have happened. And they would have just once again totally ignored us and gave us no appreciate, showed no appreciation for, for our role in the in the game's success. I mean, I don't need them to come out and say, thank you. I mean, it was because of you actors. We don't need that. But my God, we don't need our faces. Well, my face blurred out. And we don't need to, you know, at least they could have sent us a copy of the game or something, anything, nothing. Absolute, mm. you guys don't exist. You, we barely recognize you. We do not recognize you. You're nothing. That was the, the feeling and the, the actions that came from their side. And then in dealing with their people later, it was clear that was a, what, what should we call it, a systemic attitude all throughout the organization. It starts at the top and it went down to the levels of production as well. There's, you know, there's all kinds of euphemisms for performers in creative productions. And the, probably the one that comes closest is meat. So that's how they just don't care. So, so, you know, in the U.S. you get what you negotiate. In Japan, they seem to pay at least what they call thank you money. So thanks for you know, understanding or re-releasing it isn't that great. It's not a lot of money, but it's, it's you know, 500,000, 2,000 bucks, something like that. Dave's still getting that. I think the, um, the original production was all put together in, under Japanese management, and HD Collection was outsourced to the California office, and that's how things are done in California. So at some point along the way, the guy in charge of that noticed, my God, we don't, we don't actually have the rights to use this stuff. Where are, the, where are the papers? And probably some emails were sent over to Japan and people fumbled and mumbled and said, well, we can't find them. As far as I managed to sort this issue out, again, through talking to people who are Donna and, and Dave who do this in Japan all the time, it's really the agent's responsibility to get that done. So the first meetings I had when I was asking about the paperwork were with the agency that was responsible for coordinating the foreign talent, coordinating the, the hiring of the foreign talent. So essentially, we're talking about the guys who put the poster up at my daughter's international school for the part of Laura and ran casting calls in various places that would attract uh, adult performers. and. They are the guys who Konami entrusted to bring actors to the auditions. And I believe they expected they would secure whatever paperwork was, was appropriate. No one could find it. That company had disbanded after that and, and from some accounts ran afoul of Konami itself in that it wasn't no long, it was no longer doing business with Konami. And so that, uh, may account for why it was never followed up on. But given that I met with the top guy at Konami, you would, and, and we specifically discussed my contract, you would think he might have paid attention to that. So it led me to believe, well, you know, I think it's low probability odds, but maybe they didn't feel the need to have a written agreement. But this, apparently, you're asking, I'm speculating because I do not know. Apparently someone in California thought it prudent to get releases. And was probably misled into the notion that releases had been signed, but they had simply been mislaid. So opening with that stuck a, you know, poked a hornet's nest because all of us were upset at how the game had gone on to such success without so much as a thank you. And, and then in my case, a blurring of my face and uh, other 
perceived slights and then to be treated like, well, you know, just send these papers because you don't have a choice and that's the way it is and we just misplaced it. So sign this quick. Hurry up. That, in, that incensed everyone. Everyone was pissed off when they got that, that first email. I'm the one who wrote back. The rest of them just ignored it. Found out everything I could about the guy who had sent me that email. I knew exactly who he was and I knew exactly where he'd worked before he worked there. And I knew what he was thinking because of who he is and what, you know, the way it was written. So, no, there was no accident there. It was more like, let's mm -hmm. just try and squeak this by, which only upset me more. I, I really don't want to dredge up all that bad blood. The, mm -hmm. the thing, it worked out very well in the end. We all learned and grew mm -hmm. through the process. Did you try to get Konami to pay you for other Silent Hill 2 re-releases before the HD collection came out? For example, when the Greatest Hits version came out or the PC version? No, because I didn't even know those things had come out. It was, you know, that's what kind of bothered me about it. I went, I like, whoa, all this stuff has gone on? Wow. And, and it was only because of the internet and fans contacting me and finding me and then the word spreading that, that I was contactable then it, it dawning on me that this game had actually been a success because it wasn't really a big success in Japan. Well, I didn't know much about it. And then, you know, peeling these layers away and finding out, my goodness, I mean, I've got, I've got fans in more than 60 countries. It's amazing. And, and some of the countries I want, you know, which language did they listen to that game in? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, I didn't. And I wouldn't, and I didn't contact them about the HD collection. They contacted me. So, like I said, it was like, well, oh, they probably were uh, surprised because I, that guy from California, he wasn't involved in ignoring me all those years or the other actors. He he he's just doing his job and was just tidying up some loose ends. He thought. Now his initial reaction was quite logical and civil, and I thought we were going to proceed to resolve the problems and move forward. But it didn't work out that way. They took a different turn. We're under the impression that the longer you wait to sue someone, the harder it becomes to do it. Do you feel that this hurt your case against Konami? It's definitely true that time is not your friend if you feel you've been wronged legally and, and you're seeking redress. In fact, in California, there's a statute of limitations on that, uh, depending on the, the type of infringement. But um, I don't feel it hurt my case against Konami because I never thought seriously about going after Konami in court. I simply wanted them to do the right thing and pay the actors for the additional territories and consoles. Mary Elizabeth has that famous rant on a panel at a con where she, well, I'm going to, mimicking what she thinks was what I, something I said. Um, but that's like listening to American politicians tell you about the secret evidence they have on Syrian activities, but we can't show it to you. We're just, we looked at it for you. So here's Mary Elizabeth making claims about what I wrote or said, which she obviously knows nothing about. So she, I don't know where she got those ideas from. If they came as talking points from Konami management, <clears throat> not certainly wouldn't be from Japan, who's just stayed out of it. Um, but anyway, she, I'm sure she regrets having said that. It, it was, it was, it was counterproductive. There, there's no right or wrong, clear right or wrong here. There's just a, like all of these problems, real life issues here and little, some, some minor pettiness and some major ego and all these different factors came together. The only really good thing that we can say for a fact is that the, the problem was resolved in the best possible way. The fans won. Troy and Elizabeth didn't lose face for, for you know, having done those parts. They, they are on the, <clears throat> the HD collection. The HD collection is what it is, so people can make a very clear evaluation for its technical merits and, and production merits on their mm -hmm. own. And I think I won't add to that um, discussion today. Whose idea was it to reunite the cast of Silent Hill 2 for the signing away of voice rights? Well, there, there wasn't actually a reuniting in person to sign the waivers or anything like that. I, I wrote to Dave and Monica and I asked them to sign their releases because I knew if I was the only one that signed, Konami would still have an excuse to ditch all of the original voices from the HD collection. Um, Dave contacted Donna. And she was the last one to sign, but only because it, it took Dave some time to contact her. Dave came by my office one night 
And I said, uh, hey, hey, let's take a picture signing these things. So Dave happened to be there. We were going out for the evening. And uh, I said, let's sign these together. And he, he allowed that to go down, which was, you know, it was a rare thing. He usually doesn't show his face in connection with Silent Hill 2. But I snapped that picture, it went up into the internet, and now it's appeared in any number of places. So it may seem like there was a reuniting. I just thought it was an important day that I had finally come to that moment where I was going to sign the paper. And I'm like, well, damn, where is that piece of paper anyway? And I couldn't find it <laughs> at first because it was, you know, dated back. It was, the process had gone on for a while. So at first we had to, you know, go through the email files and try and find the, the release that they had sent. We finally found it, and I printed out some copies, and we signed it. How much did fan videos help convince you and the other voice actors to sign the vocal performance waiver? The high number of views and the powerful comments on the She Sells parody video was a game changer for me. Soon after watching that, I had a heart-to-heart -heart with a friend of mine who's also a fan of Silent Hill 2. And he said, Guy, you don't need any money from Konami, do you? No. And it would be a serious shame if the original voices were lost to the HD collection, right? Wow. Yeah, it would be. So why don't you just take the high road here and sign the release? That puts the burden back on Konami to restore the originals. I'm like, bing! Genius. Oh, God. That was such a... Um, cathartic evening I mean, between the vodka and this, you know, brainstorming <laughs> how to solve this problem. And we were sitting on this beautiful terrace uh, in uh, Motosando at two rooms. It was fantastic. I was just two days later after hacking on it, that uh, open letter to Konami was sent to the guy who had sent the first request and then posted up on uh, my Facebook page as a note. That Letter, my letter, plus the plus the fan uproar is what taught me, or or um, is what I is what I think caused Konami to restore the original voices. That put the um, they had no way out. Really, it was checkmate. I and mean, I saw that immediately when we were talking about it. it was, Whoa, because at that point it was pretty clear they were just going to cut us out. So, you know, screw it, blame it on guy. And that was bumming me out. Now, that same fan, that intense interest and controversy about the, the, the new voices is what taught me that Silent Hill 2 is much more than a commercial property. It really is a, a work of art. And uh, I'm honored to have been a part of it. I'd feel terrible if they had cut me out of it. I'd feel doubly terrible if they had cut Monica, Dave, and Donna out and then blamed that on me. So, you know, make no mistake, I am truly grateful that it all worked out the way it did and the voices were restored. No, no money could compensate that loss. No amount of money. That's how I came away from it. You know, I definitely, it wasn't about the money. And I, you know, I just had to let my pride down a notch or two there and say, well, eh, you know, mm. who cares? But it's about the fans now. It's not about them. It's not about Konami and it's not about me. The trigger for me going after them to request compensation was their email to me out of the blue saying, uh, we, law we, we misplaced the paperwork. Please sign this release. Thank you very much. You may recall that you portrayed James Sunderland in uh, a Silent Hill 2 game, and it, we seem to have you know misplaced our paperwork. It was really that in that... Uh, that detached, I interpreted it as mildly insulting. So considering what I had then come to learn about the game and what it means to people for him to have written to me in that way. But in any case, you know, no hard feelings there. Everyone's playing a role. Everyone, they wanted to get it for free and they got it, but it wasn't free. It cost them a lot of social capital. I think it cost some people their jobs as well. What's your opinion of Tom Hewlett? Well. Uh, Tom, I, I really appreciate Tom and Devin for restoring the original voices to the HD collection. I mean, it takes, it's kind of, you got to know when to fold and they did. And that 
it worked out as best it could for all of us. Um, I don't, I'm I'm not going to weigh in on anything that he did wrong. I don't, I wasn't there. You know, he had his own sets of circumstances he was working with, but he definitely was a victim of circumstances, right? I mean, just like, like James, I mean, he's doing his thing, but there's, there's all this other stuff going on around him. Did he have a, uh, an agenda? Uh, yeah, he had an agenda, but the result is all that matters. And Tom probably could have kept us out of the restored. It was work. It was work for him to go back after, at the point they were at. It added days and hassles to the process to make those two tracks available. It wasn't, it wasn't an easy thing. It wasn't extremely difficult compared to some of the other challenges they faced. But, you know, I went to LA and had dinner with he and Devin and Monica and they spoke, I asked and they spoke at length about the technical difficulties of, of porting the original compiled uh, elements to the new uh, console platforms at higher resolution, supposedly, but you know, that we, that though pretty much those claims have all been disproved by people who ripped it onto PCs and so forth. But, but that, that doesn't matter. It was a commercial decision and a commercial project to make some money off of the treasures in the closet to bring them back to the market. And the right thing to do was have the original voices in there in any case. So it worked out perfect in the end. And, uh, like I say, Tom could have kept up a fight to prevent that, but he didn't. And he was kind enough to agree to a meeting with uh, Monica and I, and and Devin came along. I'd never met him before or, or spoke to him before, but uh, it was good. It was good for us all to clear the air. Have you heard Troy Baker's take on James Sunderland or Mary Elizabeth McGlynn's take on Mary and Maria? If so, how do you feel about their performances? Both Troy and Mary Elizabeth have great voices, and um, but I think the original performances are better. Six Ways to Sunday. They're better in every respect. They, man, they, if they weren't involved with Tom and or Devin, I don't know who they, who their connection was there. I guess Mary Elizabeth was casting agent for some other projects. So it just, I don't think they should have done it. They, they should, but you know, it was risky for them to do that. And they acknowledge that. I don't know. Like I said, though, they have great voices. They got good careers. They'll, they'll, uh, certainly not suffer for what they've done long range. I'm not sure it was a, a, a high water, it's certainly not a high water mark in their careers. It's just something they did and they thought that it was necessary at the time. So they, they undertook it with, with a you know, professional approach and they have great voices. That, that's what they do. That's their jobs. Whether they were cast appropriately for the roles or not, I'll let the fans decide. Troy has that big theatrical voice and that's a lot of people expect that. So he, he, and he, he does it well. He's got a beautiful voice. Now, Mary, I'm sorry, but even though she has a beautiful voice, she didn't come one, you know, even halfway to the performance of Monica. It's very easy for me to, see, for anyone to see that. Not even close. Why do you think contracts are viewed differently in Japan compared to the United States? It's not like, well, there's no written contracts. It's the Wild West. It's not like that. There's no written contracts because generally speaking, they're not needed. People are doing the right thing and they're being fair. This is a very long, well understood cultural Mm. zeitgeist here that the water flows down toward the sea and the farmers and villages up water are responsible for everyone below them and so on and so forth. If you screw up the water, through selfish acts, it affects the entire community. It may not affect you initially, but ultimately it will. And that is part of this culture. So it's just common sense, joshiki, that they're going to take care of everyone involved. I will tell you one thing that I've, <laughs> I've never said before. I, I wrote, they wrote to me asking me to sign a release saying the paperwork had been this late. I wrote back saying, Thanks for contacting me. I've been meaning to talk to you about additional compensation for reuses of my 
uh, performances outside of the original agreement. And um, I think if we can resolve those issues, it, it's easy to move forward. They wrote back and said, yeah, that's, that sounds uh, good. Um, let's, we need to do that. And so I wrote back and said, well, I think a, a good next step would be for you to produce the sales figures in all of the territories where SH2 has been sold. And then I never heard from them again. So, uh, you know, that I knew what question to ask because there's no way to put a price on the value of the additional territories unless you know how much they sold there. Now, that has to be discounted because no one can know for a fact how much will sell in a territory before it's released. So there's a risk factor which should be credited to their side. I had no risk in taking it to another territory, so I don't get a risk premium. But whatever the, you know, we can look at the sales in the U.S. and Japan. This is a very logical approach, right? Look at the sales in the U.S. and Japan. How much did you pay me? Okay, now you've released it in these other territories. How much did you sell there? And we can just kind of come up with a formula everybody can agree to. Mm. Boom, that was it, though. Once I mentioned, <laughs> you know, looking at the sales figures, it was over. I never mm. heard from them again. And they must have done a calculation and realized that, Josh, if we have to pay Dave and Monica and Donna and Guy, um, it's much cheaper to go and re-record the uh announcement that there were going to be new voices came after they stopped talking to me after not before and it came significant or a, a a suitable amount of time to conduct an analysis of whether or not it would be cheaper to pay the actors or, or hire new ones and that so yeah i mean that's that's obvious i would have done it that way mm. if i'd been in their shoes and i wanted to not have to deal with that problem. I would not have done it exactly the way they did it, but I would have, these are the processes that the producer would have gone through mentally mm -hmm. to manage their costs because that's what was driving the process. I mean, what, what was the point of the mm -hmm. HD collection? What was the point of that? It's like Disney re-releasing Cinderella or Snow White in a DVD deluxe edition or something like that. Yes, the point is to earn money with almost no development costs on stuff that was already proven successful. It's a formula. And um, there was just a big gap in that formula. And the gap was they didn't have clear rights to the, to the performances. So they thought, well, I mean, it's just a game. We're not supposed to pay these guys. It's a one-time payment. That's the way the business works. Yeah, it works that way at Konami. It doesn't work that way at the other game companies in Japan. Well, the guy in California didn't know that. So he just, and, and the other people who weighed in on that subject don't know that. And uh, so they made, made a series of missteps. And only because of fan pressure did they come to realize they were missteps. And only because the fans enlightened me that it was not a matter of money. And, and I'm, you know, it wasn't that they changed my mind. They just helped me to see that it wasn't a matter of money for me either. Because I didn't need the money and I didn't sure didn't want to go into a, a legal battle with those guys or a legal, mm -hmm. uh, anything close to a court. I just wanted them to mm -hmm. recognize us for our work. It seemed they were dead set on ignoring us, not mm -hmm. recognizing us. I got sucked into their zeitgeist. Their, their whole, you know, approach to it was money. Re-releasing the HD collection had, from Konami's perspective, had nothing to do with art. How was the experience working with Team Silent and the other actors? I very much enjoyed working with Team Silent and the other actors. Uh, Dave Shoffley, who played Eddie, and, and I are good friends to this day. And in fact, uh, we're going to go out tomorrow night again and, and uh, have some pizza. <laughs> As you know, uh, Silent Hill 2 is an intense story. And so the vibe on the set was often dark and heavy. Well, some of that tension spilled over into an exchange between me and Monica one day, but we got past it and we, I think we just flipped all that heat right back into our performances. And Monica's a super lady and I, I appreciate everything she did to help me up my game. She's a talented 
performer. Now about the creative uh, process, well, there was definitely room for back and forth. Uh, and Team Silent chose us from all the people they auditioned because they felt we were most like the characters as they had imagined them. So they they did want us to be the force behind creating the character, the main force. But there were things that they wanted to have that fit in with their their game plan. <laughs> so in terms of creating the persona or how the character would express a feeling or an emotion, that was pretty much left to the actors. Uh, but man, I mean, with me and Monica and Dave and Donna in the room, uh, playing off each other, it wasn't like we weren't under pressure to to do better. As you listen to uh, Monica's performances, and then you have to perform. There's no way you're going to, you know, take it lightly. So, um, and vice versa. This is we were pretty heavy into the to the role. However, as I say, there were there were game issues that they needed. So certain things had to be done the way they wanted it. Certain lines had to be recorded the way they wanted them. I would never imagine James saying this town is this town is full of monsters. How can you sit there eating pizza? He he would have said something a little edgier, I think, about when he described the monsters. I don't but but it, it you know these guys knew their audience. They knew that that was the word they wanted and monsta in Japanese has monsta has its own meaning. There's a lot of words in that are they call them loan words, but that's really a misunderstanding. They're not borrowed meanings. They're borrowed sounds. The meanings the Japanese apply to these seemingly foreign sounding words like monsta are different than the way we might look at them. Uh, uh, another one is complex. If you, the Japanese complex means only one thing in, in English, com complex usually means something that's complicated and secondarily means a set of buildings like at a shopping mall or at a, an office park. And thirdly, might refer to a psychological condition. In Japan, complex only means a psychological condition and it only refers to one psychological condition. So monsta may be, I don't know, because I haven't really studied what monsta means, but monsta may fall in that category and then Maybe why they wanted that word doesn't matter. Fans <laughs> have made it clear that that line was a big hit. So <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm glad they, they, they wanted it. There was other areas where they wanted something like the dog ending, which I thought was absolutely ridiculous. That was the one I pushed back the hardest on. Uh, it was a real standoff. And <clears throat> I probably kept that from happening for at least a week if and getting closer toward the end. And finally, Sato came and said, look, guy, it's a game. And this is like a no one's going to see this until they've played it several times. And it's a, what we call like an Easter egg thing. It's a it's a secret thing for the real deep game fans. So trust me, it's going to be OK. And on that basis, I I understood. And then we did it because for me, it wasn't a game. I never, never felt like, and I don't think any of the other actors, maybe Dave, because he's done more games, but I don't think the others were in a game sense, like in our minds when we were doing this, like, wow, we're going to be in a game. Uh, there'll be people playing this like a game. We just recorded all the cutscenes. It's more like that movie, that uh, movie version of the game someone's put up on YouTube. It runs about an hour and a half. That's the way we viewed it, more like that type of a dramatic performance. So we're in these character roles and they're talking about you know, aliens coming down or there's a dog behind the counter and, and, and it's, it didn't make any sense to me. But I shortened this, tighten this one up here. That, uh, as far as a creative boss, what, there's no doubt that the the single most influential person on the mocap set was Sato. He called the shots. He made the final decisions. He, he Sato normally didn't have anything to say about the performances other than a timing issue or a position issue. Uh, but when he wanted something uh, his way, he got it. And, um, you know, overall, the work was great fun uh, because I enjoy acting. And uh, but as I say, James is a seriously messed up guy and playing him over several months really uh, sucked a lot out of me. So it was 
fun, but it was also uh, stressful. What's your favorite monster in Silent Hill 2? And what's your favorite ending? Oh, Pyramid Head for the win, man. That's easy. My favorite ending, that used to be an easy answer for me. When I first started watching scenes from the game, I very much preferred the leave ending you know, as a father. And, uh, you know, more recently, I've started warming up to the to the to the beauty inherent in the in water ending. The other ones are there's nothing there. There are only those two. The mm-hmm. rest are all jokes. <laughs> How do you feel James may have felt towards the other characters? Were you given any motivations before the scenes or anything like that? I don't recall being given advice on a regular basis about how I was supposed to feel toward the other characters. The any suggestions about the character relationships came in the early uh, sessions. And it was Sato who gave me the best piece of advice about James. He said, and this was very early on, he said, James is the center of the story, but don't overplay him. He doesn't need to call attention to himself. Think of him like Clint Eastwood. He's sort of a deadpan character. It's the other characters, their actions and their words that will define James's character. Uh, Oh, okay. That, yeah, I got that. So he had obviously given it a lot of thought and had a model in his mind. Uh, Let's see. How do I feel about the other characters? Again, I'm just how I played James, how I felt, how that's interpreted by the viewer is going to be perhaps different. But that's the beauty of art. So let's say, how do I feel about Angela? Well, Angela is clearly mentally unstable and she's scary. So I have healthy respect for her. I don't want to see Angela get hurt, but I also don't want her becoming my responsibility. And you, you'll you see those those feelings expressed in certain lines and, and interactions. So, you know, I, I, I kill the, what do you call it, the door monster in that mm. critical scene where she's facing that demon. And I, that doesn't appear to be my monster. I don't seem to have created that. It's not something I would have generated. It seemed, I don't know where it came from in the game world. It came from her or, or whatever. But in any case, I step in and protect her in that way because I don't want to see her get hurt. But I also can't even speak when she talks it toward the end of the game in a kind of nasty way about not being willing to take care of her forever or love her or whatever which I obviously don't want to do, but I don't want to see her commit suicide. So that's that's Angela. Laura, is that her name? Yeah, she's a pest, but I am concerned about her. <laughs> uh, Maria. Ooh, well, Maria, she's a confusing story. She's attractive, no doubt, and she's useful in the, my search for Mary. But Maria is a needy and difficult person, and I definitely... Do not want her becoming my responsibility. And uh, she, I don't know what she wants, but I don't think she knows what she wants, but I, I, that's my feeling about her. Again, she's a, she's a risk. Mary, I love Mary. No, wait, I despise Mary, but I love Mary. You know, she died of that damn disease three years ago. Then... I got a letter. She said she's waiting for me in our our special place. Our special place. I wonder what she needs. I think Eddie and James should open a pizza parlor or something together. And and there, (laughs) there's such, there's so much potential. They're obviously very different, but uh, you can kind of sense that James, I mean, why would you, even engage with a guy like Eddie and to begin with in the, in that first scene and, and then care about him and, and, and care about his spirit being going to the dark side and so forth. You know, you just ignore those people if you don't care about them in life. He definitely made some, felt some kind of connection with Eddie in that, in the, in the, uh, the performance. And, um, I feel the same way with Dave. (laughs) I don't know. I, I guess, uh, James, he gets pretty pissed off with Eddie at that in that in the meat locker room there. But uh, well, he gets shot by him. I'd be pretty peeved. <laughs> yeah, I, I I can't really have it's it's hard because I can't call up 
that anger, that, that whole scene was put together by the by the uh, by the uh, you know the game creation side, the, the the CG people and so forth. There was the, none of the performances involved anger, real real hatred or anger between Dave and I. They they were just little bits and lines, and some of them are uh, slightly funny, uh, the way the words were used. I didn't step in to make them more menacing. I didn't you know, push for more menacing lines or anything like that because I didn't feel that about him. I might have, if I did, if I felt Jane, uh, if I felt that Eddie was a despicable, disgusting, vile person, I, I probably would have been more menacing toward him in the way I gave the lines. And I might have suggested some changes, but I didn't. Would you do more voice acting if given the opportunity? You've said before that you would reprise James if asked, but what about trying other characters in other games as well? Yes, I would. I'd play James again and I'd, I'd consider other parts. Mm-hmm.